Uh, I'm so happy to be here. I was in a small room with Jim and he said, are you fired up? And I said, absolutely. Like this is an amazing group and uh, I'm totally honored to uh, present. And really my goal here is to uh, give you all a way of looking at our politics and our world that uh, I hope is valuable for you and that you can actually talk about a couple times times in uh, in small groups. And uh, what I'm going to do is um, ask some questions, tell some stories, and introduce some distinctions that I hope you then can use in the small groups. And uh, I put together a slide deck with mostly pictures. So the title I've given the, to this conversation is From Despair and Anxiety. Notice how it feels to hear those words to curiosity and resolve. And these are examples of what I'm going to call moods, which is a lens on understanding our politics, our communities, and our world that I have found just immensely useful over the last 20 or so years, uh, both in the larger world and in my personal life. And I hope you get some value from it too. And before I go on to define that, I want to share a few examples of challenges in the world in which uh, I think moods can be illuminating in making sense of things. So I want to start with a phenomenon about a decade ago known as birtherism. I don't have to tell you the history of this. Everybody knows it. Here's a billboard. I don't think I saw this exact billboard, but I saw many like it in uh, in Oregon where I lived. And so, you know, one of the questions that um, I would often ask myself is like, what's what's behind this? Not like who are the people and how they put it together, but like, what's the story behind why someone would want to to go ahead and do this? Um, a movement that actually helped lead to the next presidency, and Several years later, after Mr. Trump was elected, uh, a sociologist from Berkeley named Arlie Hochschild wrote a wonderful book called Strangers in Their Own Land. And this progressive slash liberal professor went to Louisiana and interviewed a bunch of people about why they saw the world in the way that they did and why they voted the way that they did. And although she did this before that election, uh, it came out after, and these are many of the people who voted for Mr. Trump. And what she discovered is that uh, almost to the person, they followed a certain narrative about the world in which all of us are standing in line waiting for the uh, fruits of the American dream. And the experience that they all had is that other people were cutting in line and that uh, they weren't getting their fair shake. And these other people didn't deserve to cut in line. And uh, and, they don't, and and this was a source of uh, a lot of their narrative and a lot of their politics. Now, if we were to create a little thought bubble, we might generalize this as, speaking of one of those folks, and again, this is something that we all experience. You've harmed me. And there's nothing you can do to make it better. You have cut in line or allowed someone else to cut in line. And there's nothing you can do to make it better. And many of them saw President Obama as someone who kind of uh, had sort of stolen their world and was allowed to cut in front. It's a lot of racial dimensions to it. I'm focusing here on the assessment. This is an example of the mood that I'll call resentment. All right, number two. Anti-racist training. So back around 2017, 2018, uh, my synagogue in Portland held an anti-racist training. This was a few years before George Floyd's murder, but during the period of Black Lives Matter. And the way, uh, when I came into the room, I noticed a whole bunch of pictures around the exterior of the room. And the focus of the session was to sort of walk around and talk about what we saw. And all of them were stories of 
and of ex actual um, discrimination. Uh, we might call it oppression of um, victimization. And uh, none of which was new to me. Uh, and I actually think it's was an incredibly important thing to talk about. And, 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 and uh, at one point I did a little experiment and I, I just wanted to test out the room. And I was like, you know what? Uh, Cause the whole conversation was sort of like, this is horrible. Everything is bad. I feel terrible about it. And, um, and I said, gee, uh, I'm really grateful that we're actually talking about this and seeing this very clearly. And I noticed people look at me like, what do you mean you're grateful? And, and I also then went on because I had spent some time with Greg Thomas, uh, who uh, senior fellow here, uh, uh, learning about the how the Black American cultural experience has contributed to American culture. And so I shared something about that. Crickets, absolute crickets. And um, what I realized was there was a particular story or assessment there that was present in every single one of my synagogue members, my fellow members, which was I've harmed you and there's nothing I can do to make it better. And that's a mood that we might call guilt. And then we get to climate, which is one of the areas where I'm finding moods to be uh, most illuminating. So, you know, why is it? And this has been true for years. Just bringing up the topic has so many of us just feeling down in the dumps. I think you know what I'm talking about. So here there's an assessment. You know, there's nothing new possible here. It's basically all going to hell. We not, may not be aware of that we're thinking that, but that's kind of what's underlying it. And in many cases, we're actually saying it. So I've just shared with you three moods, resentment, uh, guilt, and resignation. So now let me talk about what we mean by moods. First of all, it's not the same thing as an emotion that passes. This was a distinction that a teacher of mine made uh, 20 years ago. I thought was wonderful. If you think of an emotion as being like the weather, which uh, can change within minutes or hours, it's sort of a short-term feeling state um, emotions that is in our body, in our hearts, um, we can feel uh, guilt. We can feel sadness and anger. Mood is more like a climate. It's a steady state, longer pattern of weather. Even though climate changes, the climate where I live in Michigan is very different from where my brother lives uh, in Austin. So what emotions are like the weather, moods are like the climate, something that sticks with us for a while. So the way I'm defining this is as a persistent emotional state, persistent emotional state coupled with an assessment, which is something our mind does. And I gave you in those thought bubbles assessments, like uh, I've done something wrong and there's nothing I can do to make it better. That's an assessment that goes with guilt. And then there's a feeling, we all know that feeling of guilt. And what's interesting about moods is that it leads to a particular predisposition for action. Some moods are constructive. Some moods are destructive. Okay. Some moods lead us to create new possibilities in our world. And I might argue, allow us to be part of the developmental politics movement and others really get in the way. So quick personal note. Um, Right around the time I discovered moods, I realized that although for a long time, I thought I was this really fun, creative, positive person, that actually the background was anxiety. I learned it through the Enneagram. And it's, you know, like Pigpen, who has the dust cloud and peanuts, sort of anxiety is something, you know, if you see me in a frame, if you can actually measure my emotional state, like right now, there's always anxiety associated with that. And um, 
Then, and again, more, a few more personal notes on moods. Um, my wife and I, 15, 17 years ago, had as many people do challenges with fertility. And what was very interesting is that after a couple of years, I went into what I'd call a mood of acceptance, which is like, you know what, this, this has happened. Like, this is the reality. And, you know, we sort of got into an adoption pool and my wife had a very different response, which was resolve. I remember she had some things up on the wall that was just like sheer determination to, uh, to get pregnant and to have a baby. And, uh, we actually did. We were given a one in 10,000 chance by the, uh, uh, fertility doctor to have a baby. We had one and then we had another. In fact, it was, I was so accepting of that assessment that when she showed me the pregnancy test, I said, the positive test, I said, there must be an error. <laughs> so, but she was in resolve and um, that produced a certain set of actions. Um, and then finally, uh, we found ourselves in the fall of uh, 20, uh, 2020 trapped indoors by smoke for a week in Oregon by the wildfires. And um, at some point, uh, we were sort of fighting the reality. God, I wish this wasn't happening. I wish this wasn't happening. And we finally kind of accepted, you know what? It's here. And we decided to get out. And we decided to fly to Michigan. And uh, to make a long story short, a year later, we moved. Um, we accepted, that's another mood. We accepted the reality of the situation rather than rejecting it. Um, now I'd like to introduce these moods um, and then we'll go into a breakout by uh, again, sort of returning to uh, a couple of different challenges that we're all involved in. So this is a picture of George Floyd. So how is this relevant to America's racial reckoning? Uh, this has been a, uh, a topic, a challenge that I've been deeply engaged in the last several years. Um, so uh, I think everyone knows White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo. And, uh, but we might wonder, what mood does that evoke in us? There might a lot of, a lot of potential moods. I, I think guilt is one of them which is uh, particularly if I'm identified as white, like I've harmed you and there's nothing I can do to make it better. And in fact, if I uh, have uh, emotional difficulty in a discussion around this, uh, bringing that up, I'm also doing damage to you. So uh, one of the things we can ask about any book or framework or set of ideas is what mood does it evoke in us? And, uh, each mood has an aim and in the aim of guilt is actually to punish myself. So um, to the extent that many people identified as white flagellated themselves, flagellated ourselves, kind of beat ourselves up, that's emerging from a particular mood of guilt. Now, I'm not saying that there wasn't in slavery, Jim Crow era, the brutal ending to reconstruction, um, incredible injustice, incredible brutality. I'm talking about the mood that we use to interpret it. And then we had another big thinker who came uh, and rose um, to prominence, which was Abraham X. Kendi, how to be an anti-racist. And uh, A lot of people who've been talking about this book say, God, you know, it seems like you can't get out of it. No matter what you do, you're racist. You know, there's not a lot you can do here. So um, there's an assessment there. And I've read all of his books, even How to Be an Anti-Racist Baby, which is uh, for fortunately very brief. Um, you've harmed me and there's nothing you can do to make it better. You've harmed me and there's nothing you can do to make me. And then whatever harm you've experienced, you deserve it. I didn't mention that earlier. Whatever harm you've experienced, you deserve it. Ah, wow. So the aim here is to punish others. So um, when any of us are in a mood of resentment, it predisposes us to try and kind of knock people around a little bit, right? 
Um, but there are other options. So how about Resolve? So this is a book by Martha Jones called Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for Us All. Um, I read the book and wow, what an example of we can do this. I will do this. And what an interesting way of looking at the same tragic set of historical facts. One could just look at the barriers and the lack of equality, which is, uh, believe me, I've done my research and continue to do. And then there's another story, which is a story of resolve, right? Of um, saying, we're going to make this better. And then there's acceptance. Uh, and I mentioned that earlier around climate change, where we are, you know, saying, you know, and this is a Albert Murray, which uh, Greg Thomas introduced me to his book, Stomping the Blues. And Albert Murray would say, you know, life is a lowdown, dirty shame. And then you have a choice of, you know, what do you want to do? Kill yourself or, you know, uh, go out to the Savoy and uh, go dancing at nine o'clock at night. Like you have a choice. Um, so the assessments here is a couple of them. I accept what has happened. That doesn't mean I like it. That means I accept it. And I accept that the future is uncertain. Right. Um, and my aim here is that I want to preserve my agency, my capacity to act, and maybe even to improvise. So here's a couple of quotes Albert Murray again. Um, We're not giving up. This is about blues. It's not suicidal music. It's not self commiseration music. It's not self pity music. It's face the facts music. And then from James Stockdale, you, uh, from the book, Good to Great, uh, you must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. So acceptance is, as I see it, is like with climate change, with our racial reckoning, is like, what are the brutal facts? Can I accept them? Now, what are we going to do? I'm not fighting against it. I'm accepting it. And then, uh, and then climate change. Um, so we have the uninhabitable earth, which is both of these books I'm showing here, are wonderful books, um, and generation dread. So, you know, what are some of the moods that many of us feel around climate? One is resignation. Um, nothing new is possible. And, uh, here's the catch. And someone probably might want to mute themselves. Um, unless you think nothing new is possible, but obviously you don't cause you just change it. Thank you. Um, so in resignation, uh, here's the catch. I may say I'm in resignation or despair. What I'm actually doing is I'm actually creating a chance for myself to feel innocent because if there's nothing to do, then there's nothing that I can do. So I'm not responsible. So we're like, you know, marionettes. It's a very in interesting insidious, uh, underline of resignation that believe me, I have noticed in myself. Uh, then we have anxiety. I've already told you, it's one of my top moods, um, the assessment, something bad is going to happen. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to put together my prepper kit um, uh, or, you know, take care of my family in other ways. And that's, that's the aim here is to protect myself and others. But here's the thing, and I'm just kind of wrapping up to a close here. Um, when I have uh, seen panels on climate, there's always a question at the end or a speaker and they always say, what makes you hopeful? And it's very interesting. It's almost like there are two choices around climate. You can either feel despair and anxiety or hope. It's one or the other, right? You can choose one or you can choose the other. And I feel like this is a false choice. There's actually more here to it. Um, so in climate, maybe a little bit of wonder would help. Uh, so the Ministry for the Future, I, I know Steve there, and I know a few others of you are familiar with this book uh, by Kim Stanley Robinson. It is uh, a story of the future uh, by this science fiction writer looking out uh, not too far, actually. It starts with a horrendous heat wave in India that causes um, hor horrific deaths. Um, but traces the trajectory of what if um, we could actually turn things around and it presents a plausible scenario involving quant uh, carbon quantitative easing 
and uh, more or less like paying oil companies to keep money in the ground. It's not quite that simple. And uh, is a kind of a hero's journey projected forward. And, you know, after I read this book, and I'm going to credit uh, David's story, another senior fellow who I, I don't think could make it in tonight, um, with, uh, with introducing me to the book. And you know what it brought me to was a sense of wonder, um, sometimes known as curiosity, which is like, all of a sudden, the assumption I had about how things gonna, was going to turn out was sort of stopped in its tracks. And I realized, I don't actually know. I don't know how this is going to turn out. And I'm kind of curious. And I actually got kind of excited about it. And so I have an open aim. So notice how different wonder is from resignation. It's, I know things are going to be terrible and there's nothing I can do to, I don't know. And hmm, I wonder what's possible here. And let's not forget about gratitude, something I tested out in that uh, anti-racist training. So here the assessment is something positive has happened and someone or something outside of me is responsible. And so my predisposition here is to say thanks. And then we have American politics. Very briefly, um, Steve talks wonderfully about um, grievance and gratitude. And so I've just emphasized gratitude. And then Our Towns is an amazing book by Jim and Deb Fallows, where they traveled around uh, little towns around the United States. And instead of asking people about national politics, they asked them about local politics. And they noticed that when they asked people about local politics, it was like a whole different part of the brain was active. And the moment national politics came in, everybody's mood shifted. They didn't use that word. I'm going to use that word. Locally, they were into resolve and gratitude and acceptance. You bring up national politics, guilt, resignation, resentment, anxiety. Very interesting. Yeah, just a couple of appreciations. First of all, um, those of you who mentioned the word frustration, um, which is, you know, an assessment that this isn't working. And uh, that's different, I would say, from resignation, which is that nothing new is possible. Uh, so sometimes migrating from despair to frustration actually is helpful. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. And there's a lot of other moods, contempt, amusement, joy, um, ambition, anguish. Anguish is one of my favorite moods, which is... Um, I'm afraid of what I'm going to do. It's a particular form of fear, like, oh, I'm going to F this up. Oh, I'm going to mess up my parenting. Oh, I'm going to work, you know, the, I'm going to mess up this, uh, this meeting. It's a very interesting mood that one can have. It's directed at yourself and it's fear. So that also is present as well. Um, and then I also want to acknowledge Eric Troth for referring to your own emotions, which is what I want to turn to next. I deliberately asked this first question about what are you noticing in the conversation kind of out there? And now uh, I'd like to just say a few words that will help us um, look into our own moods, which is a little bit more challenging, which is why I saved it for a second. So let me just say a few things here. Okay. So a few other uh, pointers about moods is that uh, we kind of have uh, a composite of moods. Some of us have more than others. I mentioned anxiety earlier. I also have some ambition, which is defined as like, we can do this. It's a little different, little different from resolve, which is we will do this, but it's like, we can, it's possible. I've got resentment and I got curiosity. I just put this little chart together. It's not scientific. Um, uh, we inherit moods. Um, they come from our family. They come from our life experience. Uh, like a lot of other things, they come to us. Um, moods are infectious. Uh, when I work with leaders around moods, I say, pay attention to your mood because you're infecting everyone in your organization with it. Like a cold. And so we can notice which moods we're infecting others with and which moods they're infecting us with. Um, groups have moods. So there was a mood in the 
attack on the Capitol on January 6th and uh, probably a different mood in candlelight vigils, like the one that I'm showing right here. Um, and uh, we're often subject to our moods. Uh, many of you, I think, are familiar with Robert Keegan's notion of subject and object. When we're subject to a perspective or a feeling or a mood, that means we can't see it. We're not aware of it. It owns us. It holds us. Um, and then we maybe can make it an object in our awareness. We can see it. We can mold it, right? And that's a big move, a subject object move in adult development. And so here I'm applying that to moods or gosh, what if we could become aware of the moods in our own lives that shape us in our families and in our politics, make them objects of awareness, and then maybe shift. Um, we can do that by hanging out with different people, uh, reading and watching different things. Um, with climate, grieving, there's a lot of work around grieving. Uh, taking the humility pill is just my term for realizing that I don't know what's going to happen. Um, shifting our conversations, which is a big part of my own work. And then there's a whole variety of somatic practices that I think a lot of people here are familiar with. A lot of these are useful to shifting our own moods. Uh, so question, and we'll have about maybe eight, seven or eight minutes. Um, which moods do you frequently find yourself in around American politics? Uh, and uh, why don't we, that's probably enough. Um, I would say ride your groups of two or three. Um, but again, uh, you'll know you're doing this exercise well, when you come up with some term that sounds something like a mood and that describes your own experience. <laughs>